if someone else has started, you know, 10 months after you and got way better results than you, so what? It doesn't make a difference, right? If you've been doing it for, you know, three years, etc., and, you know, you're doing way better than someone else, etc., whatever it may be, it, it, it doesn't make any, any difference because at the end of the day, you should just stay and focus on like, yourself. It's your race. Like, you run it. If you want to jog it, jog it. If you want to sprint it, sprint it. And don't worry too much about uh, what other people are doing. You're listening to Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast, your resource for one-of-a-kind insights into the world of e-commerce and business in the modern age. This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. Harry Coleman, aka Beast of Ecom, conveys a unique style that shows how appealing and exciting the industry can be. But it wasn't easy. From running on less than four hours of sleep and taking naps in his car during breaks, to now a seminal dropshipping enterprise and massive YouTube following, my talk today with Beast of Ecom reinforces the belief that success in this industry is in your head and in your heart. Beast of Ecom, Harry Coleman, it is an honor to have you here. Thank you for being on the show. Welcome to Ecomonics. No problem, dude. It's a pleasure to be on here. It's going to be fairly interesting. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to having a decent conversation with yourself. I endeavor to make him as interesting as, well, maybe not as possible, but certainly as interesting as uh, any one person can reasonably expect. As always, we begin with a question known throughout the land. The most important question I could possibly ask, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so for those who have never heard of me before, my name is Harry Coleman. If you may not have heard of that name, you may have heard of Beast of Ecom, which is my online kind of persona. I've got a YouTube channel, but most importantly, what I do is e-commerce and more specifically dropshipping. So I run a lot of dropshipping stores. Um, I've got a YouTube channel and I've also got a uh, course as well, which is Ecom Beast 2.0, which helps people how to essentially do what I do uh, and helps uh, a lot of people out. So in a nutshell, that's me. And um, previously before, for anyone who was wondering, I used to work nine to five jobs, but I've been doing e-commerce for about four years now. Yeah, I was curious about that too. But thankfully for me, I got to do some some prep on that. And one of the things for our listeners, just to characterize your expectations for this interview, my guest here, he's, uh, he's quite out there. His YouTube presence is substantial. And so what we're going to do our best today is to find some unique avenues, some unique directions we can go with this conversation. Uh, so then that way, if you like what you hear today, you're definitely encouraged to uh, check out more of his content. So Beast of Ecom, I'm a pretty big nerd. I appreciate the theatrical quality to personifying yourself. Um, I will say before I did any research, not knowing what you looked like, I was picturing a cross between a bear and a wolverine but um where does uh where did the beast of ecom come from why did you uh go with that persona it's a that's a very good question i don't think anyone's actually asked me that question before hey mission accomplished oh uh so yeah mission accomplished on that one well i think when i was doing the the whole of the i didn't want to just because my name's so kind of like generic i thought uh, you know everyone else there who's out on youtube was just their kind of name so i I was doing my research around different names and um, I wanted to be like Wolf of Ecom, but then that was kind of like really cliche. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know what happened, but for me personally as well, I like to have the, um, I like to make sure that I've got the names availability on every single platform. So it had to be available on Instagram. It had to be available uh, as a Facebook page. It had to be available on YouTube. So, if, and I do this again, I apply this kind of, uh, you know, um, whatever you want to call it, methodology to, again, stores and those kind of things. So when it comes down to picking names, I had to make sure that it was across those. And just Beast just kind of just, I don't know where it came from, but um, if I couldn't have Wolf, I just, you know, I just came with uh, with Beast. And then that's kind of just how it uh, how it rolled and got the logo made and the rest is kind of history, I suppose. Yeah, and m maybe it hasn't influenced or hasn't uh, worked its way into the DNA of any of what you do, but I don't know, I, I hear Beast of Ecom and I think this is a guy that, really goes for the uh, for the jugular of success and, uh, and, and powers through it. So is, I don't know, do people get any impressions when they think of that? Is there anything that, any decisions that you make is, hmm, how do I, how do I represent the, the beast persona in my, in my actions, my endeavors? Uh, I think it's more down to the results. I think when I first came out on YouTube, again, w without kind of, you know, downplaying, um, I was doing a lot of, uh, of e-commerce previously before I even started a YouTube channel. 
and I was getting you know fantastic and great results previously before I had no online branding or online um, personality whatsoever. And I think the first ever video that I put out was how I'd done uh, a million in uh, in sixty days. I think it was where back then in in, in um, you know on my first YouTube videos. I think about two years now. It probably, I think it's probably one of my most viewed videos. So I think that uh, the, the persona is not necessarily me because if, if you talk to me or anyone else who talks to me, you know I'm not. I'm naturally introverted, so I'm not a, a, one of these beasts who just uh, kind of thing. <laughs> you know. So it's more of a case of uh, I think it's down to my, my my results. That's what probably I'd tie it to, if anything. I'm an introvert too, so you know I've I've got a voice for this, and I'm and I'm grateful for that. We are we're given the gifts to uh, to do what we can to make the world a better place. But the distinction between an introvert and an extrovert is that when I think extrovert, I think, and I'm not trying to denigrate anybody by the way, but I think a smaller dog that is constantly barking, maybe because we have a dog down in our apartment who's constantly barking. Whereas when I think of a of a of an introvert, I think of a big dog, someone who's more quiet and reserved, but when they're roused, they have this inner energy that they let out. And then all of a sudden you think, well, okay, we're going to leave this dog alone. Or we're not going to, we're not going to cross this dog. So I, I think both have different ways of getting those powerful results. But in a way, the extroverts tend to be more consistently out there, whereas the introverts tend to keep their energy in until they let it out. 100%. It's something that I've, I've been throughout. And, it, it, and I've been saying that if you told me that I have a YouTube channel, then the first ever video that I put out took me like three, four days just to put together a 15 minute video because, you know, you're not used to being in front of a camera as an introvert. You're not used to. And again, now I've done, um, you know, I spoke on stage in, in New York and, and those kind of things where, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to jump up and do a, 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 a you know, I'd freeze up if I was doing a, a school project. It wouldn't be something that I'd volunteer to do. But, you know, you, over time, I think you can just, you know, put yourself out there. You get more comfortable with your voice. And yeah, I'm kind of comfortable with, with doing things like this now. Just in the interest of uh, being transparent, I think, I haven't been counting, but I think this is an interview maybe 2021, 20, somewhere around there. I, we've been doing these since March, April, probably around May, maybe like early June. Doing them consistently to, to a week with the exception of uh, last week when somebody had to cancel, uh, no harm, no foul. I definitely experience a, a nervousness uh, before them because uh, I'm meeting people for the first time and people's time is highly valuable. And so there is definitely a lot of this inner energy that has to come out to want to be able to do a good job. But uh, I can only spend so much time talking about wanting to do a good job as opposed to actually wanting to do a good job. Um, fun fact about me is I used to do stand-up comedy. I was one of those guys in high school where people would say, oh, man, you should totally get into comedy. And then I did. And, you know, making people laugh just in the hallway, yeah. not the same thing as getting on stage and making a bunch of strangers laugh. It was... Yeah, it, for for an introvert, that was uh, that was not an easy experience. I could imagine. Yeah, your um, your ecom course has uh, has seven modules, and of course, I welcome listeners to check it out. But the one that I I really want to talk about today is the first one. It's the mindset one. So I ask this of nearly every guest uh, because this has this is something that I want to hammer constantly. So what is the mindset that you promote and you live by? Yeah, so for me, it's more about, it's all about kind of like being in charge of what you want to do with yourself and being, being in control of, you know, your life and being able to achieve what it is you want to achieve. Because, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who want to do a lot of things. They want to do, they want to quit their job or they want to, you know, be their own boss or, you know, just want to live this life where they can travel and do all these kind of things but they don't have it in them to they're either like scared or they uh they're waiting for the perfect opportunity or they you know they they do so much and then that doesn't work out and then they retreat back again mm -hmm. so for, for, for me it's all about just being able uh and having a mindset that i can you know i see where i want to be you know like before you know, I could afford things. I was, you know, driving a Citroen Saxo, a grey one, which was like 1998 plate. Google it if you guys don't know what one of those are. But a really crappy car. But I would drive one of those cars thinking it was like a Bentley, right? Or a BMW and those kind of things. Because mm. I'm all about taking action and then learning from that action. If you fail, then you fail. So what? Learn from it. But you've got to always take action and never quit, even if, you know, you, you don't get the results that you want the first time around, if that makes sense. It does. You had the mindset of this is a, uh, a luxury vehicle while it's just a vehicle that's going to get you from point A to point B. 
and potentially a point C. And I think it's all, it, a lot of that just comes down to relativity because for a lot of people, not only do they not have a car, they don't have the means for a vehicle. They might not even have roads. So just the very thought of having a, a, a vehicle, one might can put themselves in the mind of, wow, I've, you know, I've, got, I've got a mode of transportation. I can go places. I can, I can go fast. And so you can have that same, I don't want to say, I, it's, I hesitate to say luxury, but you can certainly realize how fortunate you are uh, without having to compare yourself to somebody who does have that car. I mean, one of the times that happened to me was when I was just waiting for the subway. You know, it used to be routine for me. And then one day it just hit me how lucky I was that this massive train from the underground was coming towards me. The doors were going to open on their own. I was going to get in, go home quickly too. And I still didn't have a car, didn't have a car then. But that mindset of this is what we've got. And we are actually quite fortunate to have it. So, you know, we have more advantages than I think we give ourselves credit for sometimes. I think just to add on to that is that I'm a firm believer of you have to be able to believe what you want to achieve. I mean, believe it before you can achieve it, essentially. And I used to think this time and time again, like some, you know, when I'd see someone before I was even doing, you know, like a thousand dollars a day, you know, you'd get to like that, that everyone gets to that point when they're starting out. It's like, I can't hit a thousand dollars a day. And then you hit it. And then you see people posting screenshots of $10,000 a day and your mind just can't comprehend, oh, I must be fake or they must be doing mm -hmm. something completely different. But you have to think to yourself, okay, it's being done. If you can't possibly think that you can make $10,000 a day, then you're not going to be able to do it. Like you just, you, you can't convince yourself to make something that you don't think that you can personally achieve. So that's kind of one thing that I always do as well is, is if someone's doing a hundred K a day, okay, cool. You know, I've done X, Y, and Z. I can do that, you know? And that's why I think people need to condition themselves to, is to believe that they can actually do it. Because if you don't believe, then you can't possibly achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look at some of the uh, success stories throughout my research, there's the needs to believe in oneself. I certainly, I, I totally agree with that. And then there's also that sense of, I almost hate to use the, the slang term for it, but more money, more problems. Where I think, well, this guy's making 100000 a day or 100000 a month. I wonder what kind of caliber of issues this person is dealing with as a result of that success. Um, at, the, at the point that you are now, what, what are some of the obstacles or some of the uh, issues that you're dealing with compared to in your earlier parts of your, your journey? Yeah, for sure. So first and foremost, when you are doing more money, you need to spend more on uh, on Facebook adverts. You need to, of course, hire a uh, a bigger team. Again, of course, your suppliers handling a lot more, you know, orders and those kind of things. There's a lot more things to go wrong. So when something goes wrong, if you're doing ten orders a day, you know, double that to you know a thousand orders a day. If something goes wrong or the shipping isn't or something isn't sent out on time, then obviously your, you know, the the, the magnitude of the problem has just you know ten x. So there's still a lot of things moving parts which can go wrong on a daily basis it just happens you know now of course with facebook you know there's a lot of things of course regular bands we always get those whether it be white hat you know or some even if it's just something's just a normal ppe campaign which is a page post engagement campaign you know anything mm. like that can still can still go down so you know there is more money more problems or whatever you want to kind of call it but you just have to still apply that same methodology of you know I've got to the point now where it's like something goes wrong. It's one of those things. I'll be pissed for 24 mm -hmm. hours. And then after that, it's like, okay, let's just keep the ball moving because you have to. Because if you get too caught up on things, then it will just drag you down. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get into some of your dropshipping expertise. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I want to get from you is a run through of some of the resources that you use. So, program sites, services. Uh, I know one of them is Ecom Hunt. I believe I saw that in one of your videos, but as an up-to-date answer to the question, what are you using these days to uh, to work on your dropshipping operation? Yeah, so first and foremost, obviously, the, 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 the commerce platform is Shopify. Of course. For the actual Shopify. Facebook for the adverts and for the traffic, sometimes Google. In terms of uh, like finding finding products, mainly like you've mentioned, Ecom Hunt is a uh, is one that I've used for a long, long period of time. It's kind of got started with things. AdSpy is another one which is on the probably more expensive end for someone who's kind of a beginner, but the it's kind of like the largest one out there with a lot of information, a lot of uh, adverts and stuff on there. So I use AdSpy. Uh, eSniper is another one that I like to use as well. For team management customer service, we use uh, Reamaze. For uh, hiring VAs, I either use Upwork, which I mm -hmm. used to use, 
for a lot of the time. Um, but now I switch to online jobs to find VA. So for anyone who wants to kind of like hire and expand their team, get their first, you know, customer service rep or whoever it may be, uh, online jobs is one. And then that's kind of what I can think of off the top of my head. And then it just like goes into like apps and those kind of things. But off the top of my head, that's what I can think of. Mm-hmm. In, in some of what I've uh, looked into you or in some of the research that I've done in regards to you, you do talk about what kind, of star, what kind of store you recommend running. It's a blend between a general store and a niche store. Now, with those two, I would characterize them initially as on opposite sides. You have generalities on one far end and then you have niche on, on the other end. So what's the middle point? What's, how, how are these two points that mesh together to create a store that's a general niche? Yeah. So, well, I'll explain this. This is, this is how I always explain. This is kind of like how I, how I say things now. This is how I always explain things when someone asks me, what sort of store should I start out? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hopefully after this question, everyone will know, depending on where they're at, because it's based on the experience that you have. Okay. So if you are someone who is watching this now and has no experience whatsoever with dropshipping, with selling online or starting any sort of e-commerce store, okay. Plus, you don't know which niche you want to get into, okay? So you're completely brand new. Then I recommend starting a general store, okay? Now, when I say general store, I always say a general store, but you only need three to four niches on that store. Some people will say a general store and they'll add like basketball stuff with cat stuff, with pet stuff, with beauty stuff, with baby stuff, etc. It's not needed. You literally only need three to four niches to make money on. So if you're undecided on maybe two or three, then just start a general store and have all of those three on because it's going to give you that flexibility, right? Now, if you are someone who has experience, okay, or you already know which niche you want to get into because some people out there have not started any store whatsoever, but they are, you know, they're really big on, you know, let's say wind sailing, right? Just as an example. So, okay, you already know what niche you want to get into. Then, okay, so start a niche store, right? Because you're going to have higher conversion rates and you already know which niche you want to get into. The biggest thing I find with a lot of people who are just getting started is something that I personally experienced as well is that you don't know which niche you want to get into. And you're like, oh, I want to use this one, but then this one looks better or this one. And then before you know it, a week's gone and (laughs) you, you haven't built no store. So that's kind of like the principle for people who have experience or know what they want to get into. Now, if you have experience, okay, and you have done a lot of research, because now, obviously, of course, when I got up and running with things, the whole one product store wasn't really a thing, okay? So only over the last few years or so, people have started to turn this one product store thing. Now, I recommend to start a one product store if you have the experience or you have done a lot of research into the actual product or into the, you know, around the product and or you've seen that it's a winner and you have a very good gut feeling that it's going to work. The reason why I say that is because on this final point is that if you start a one product store, okay, especially if you're brand new, you start a one product store, you get the, the logo made, which is kind of looks like the, the around the product, you get the domain name, all those kind of things all put together, you build the whole store out and the store doesn't work then you're stuck in a position whereby you have to change the whole of the store. You have to change the logo. You have to change the domain and all those kind of things. Whereas on the flip side, if you have a niche store or a general store, all you've literally got to do is just set up a new product page and away you go. Uh I hadn't thought about that before. I guess how I had understood it up until this point is that a one product store is just, you're just focusing on one product. So you don't have to invest additional time into checking new products for, uh, for new potential avenues. But as you're saying, with having a general uh, store or having your, your, your niche store without going too far off into like, like you said, don't have basketball, then don't have uh, pets. A lot of the back end is consistent. So we know we know we have our operation set. We have our, our apps installed. We've got the page out and the brand is there. So the brand is the all encompassing voice that helps us decide what items that we want to go for. That's great. Actually, I actually hadn't, uh, hadn't thought about that myself. Oh, thank you for that. No problem. I, I noticed you, you, you did an interview with us on our uh, Debutify blog as well. Uh, I made sure to read that too, because I wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, copying their questions. I'm going to build off one of the questions that you were asked. So from our interview, we asked some advice for starters. And one of the answers that you provided was to pick out one to three experts as your gurus. Uh, not to pick out like too many, almost on that same thread of don't go to too many niches, 
don't go off and listen to too many gurus because you're going to get a lot of different ideas and a lot of different suggestions. So let's say someone picks two to three. What should they be doing to make each choice a significant choice when considering that they're going to have, you know, a couple of different people they're going to listen to? Well, it's going to come down to, of course, first and foremost, the likability of the, or how, how can you personally digest their content? Because sometimes you can listen to a lot of people and their content isn't, uh, it may be the best content that you have ever seen, but you can't digest it, right? Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's, you know, uh, there's a lot of people out there on subjects which may be a little bit more uh, in depth than me, but, you know, I may not be able to consume their content. So when I look for people who I want to learn from, then uh, what I would say is making sure that you can understand their content and that they deliver it across in a precise way so that you understand it, essentially. And that's a lot of comments that I used to get. A lot of people used to say it was my British accent because everyone on YouTube is like kind of uh, American, right? So I used to get that quite a lot. And then on top of that, of course, is that they actually practice what they preach. Now, this is just something that there are a lot of people who can teach good and there's a lot of people who can do good. I like to think of myself as a practitioner as well as someone who can teach well as well. So again, there's a lot of the whole quote unquote fake gurus or, you know, some people who had one great month in 2016. And then there's someone who, you know, uh, done all that and then put out a course, etc. If They're really good at teaching. Then, hey, if it helps you get results, do whatever. But I personally wouldn't go to someone who was completely overweight and ask them how to get abs. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's just kind of like how I how I would do things. So that's how I would suggest someone else is do you obviously due diligence to make sure that they are someone who are still a practitioner of what they talk about. I like to think that I am still a practitioner. So they would be the two things uh, that I would say. Yeah, that reminds me of when I was in college, all of our professors were people who were also involved in the industry. So while they certainly had a lot of information to convey, they never came across like they themselves were the end point to knowledge. They were still in the industry, so they were still learning things too. They were just passing on the best information they had. So so I, that's just one way I tend to look at it, is I tend to look at people who are active as well as teaching as professors. Yeah, I mean, again, you got lecturers. If you, if you ask someone how to build a multi-million dollar business, if you go to university, you're not going to ask a professional, uh, you know, a lecturer of it, even though they might be really great at teaching, you'd rather go talk to the entrepreneur who's lost 100,000 building it and then gone on to make, you know, 100 million because they're going to want going to be the ones who will have, you know, gone through the dirt and be able to give you real life examples of, of how you can make it yourself. So I, I went through some of your YouTube videos, not too many, but, you know, there was one that I watched in full and, 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 it, and it made me laugh and you'll, you'll understand why in a second. It was about trying to make sales with a saturated product. Uh, and the product that you chose out was the shower head with the ionized, they're called anions. There's those ionized little balls in them. I, I think everyone has, uh, has seen at this point. Uh, what's funny to me is that myself and my YouTube counterpart, Connor, we've been working with Ricky as mentoring so that we can understand the industry better. We mm-hmm. picked out that product to run our store with as well. Mm-hmm. So I saw you picking out that product and how this is like one of the most massively saturated products. And I just thought, oh God, of all the products that we had to pick out. We thought we thought it was uh, we thought it was unsaturated. So for people, who obviously, you want to check out that video so you can get the full brunt of it. But uh, the question that I ask of you now is, what's the most luck that you've had with a saturated product? What's the most success? Yeah. So I mean, I tend to not go for those anymore. Mm-hmm. I've made products which have been so called quote unquote saturated. Um, I've got you like UK stores whereby they just literally sell to the UK, and this is something which again uh, a lot of uh, my students out there do as well, and which again is something else that I would recommend for someone who lives in a foreign country is what they call kind of like local general stores or local niche stores, whatever it may be. And what you can essentially do is get a saturated product, a a quote unquote saturated product, and then sell it to a market which it hasn't been so called saturated in as of yet. So a lot of people with the UK, it's a little bit harder because everyone is an English speaking country. It's one of the top four, top five out there. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things whereby you can still make sales from it. But the results just won't be there. So I've made, you know, six figures with a sat- quote unquote saturated product, which may have had, you know, 10,000 likes on it, et cetera. But it won't be something which will just, it won't be your golden winner, essentially. What I like to call them is like silver winners, whereby they've already been scaled by another one or another person, et cetera. But you can still make money from it because it's an overall winning product. 
And what I meant by uh, other different stores out there, um, local general drop shipping stores, okay, uh, in different countries is take, for example, I've got a students in France, I've mm-hmm. got students in uh, Germany, in Norway, in Netherlands, all sorts of different countries. The majority of people of the large scale dropshippers don't really target those countries because they don't really speak English, right? So mm-hmm. the adverts don't really make that much sense. Now, if you, and I've got a lot of students who actually do this, is they create a uh, store which is just based completely in that language. So a French store, all in French, the adverts in French, the landing pages in French and all those kind of things. And that way you are showing a saturated product to a market which hasn't seen this product before because everyone else is always targeting English speaking countries. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, that's certainly one of the things that I was also mentored on as well is that the the big five are the Commonwealth countries, uh, all English speaking, and then the United States. With the United States being such a big market, it's encouraged that this is the main country that you want to uh, focus your energies on. But me, I, I certainly wouldn't be able to really penetrate France until I understood the language. Same goes for all these other countries as well. Yeah, that uh, that makes a that makes a lot of sense. So one of the things I also noticed about your brand is that you're currently you're on uh, Beast of Ecom version two. So the industry changes pretty rapidly. It's, I mean, it's certainly on the forefront of technology and the forefront of commerce. Um, and you revolutionized your brand by going from version one to version two. So uh, I'm curious about this decision, why listeners should consider a major overhaul like this. You know, what was, what was the catalyst to go from version one to version two? So Econ Beast 2.0, so to, to clarify it, the Econ Beast 2.0 is the name of the course, okay? Of course, and then okay. There's always, yeah, so, so, so uh, Econ Beast but I'll pick up on what you said, is Econ Beast 2.0 is the name of the course. However, if you go onto a landing page now, it'll be Econ Beast 2.0 V4, right? And that's gone from Econ Beast 2.0 to V2 to V3 to V4. So there has been updates. And like you mentioned, Facebook adverts is consistently changing, Shopify is consistently changing, everything's consistently changing. It's important because, again, you can't put out content which is no longer relevant. Hence is why I always like to make sure that the course itself is updated with strategies that I'm currently using at the moment in time and getting results from. So I'm not one of these people just to put out a, uh, you know, a, a, and I'm not here to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want this to come across as, you know, pitching any sort of course or anything like this. I'm not, I'm not here to do any of that. Sure. But basically, you know, there's a lot of people out there who will just put out a new course every other day or a different course on something else, something else, something like this product finding course, X, X, Y, and Z. I'd rather just have one course that encompasses absolutely everything and then just make iterations on that. So it's like kind of like a one stop for everyone. So yeah, it's important to to, to update essentially. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. All right. So the next uh, bulk of questions, uh, I want to get into some of your your backstory. Some of what I know is that uh, you have a, a pretty long line of uh, entrepreneurial inclinations. One of your first things you were doing is you and your friends would find bikes in need of repair. You'd repair them and then you'd you'd sell them. And so. Usually what I ask uh, of people is what were some of the unique skills that translated into e-commerce? So for instance, um, somebody I'd spoken to earlier, Paul Motley, he had a background in chemistry. So when he would approach e-commerce, he would break things down into a uh, elemental state and then he would build up from there. It's a little bit more of a a clear cut path, I suppose, because you're looking for inventive ways to earn a living. So uh, how did you encounter e-commerce in the first place? How, did, how What drove you into this particular industry? Yeah, so I think, I'm not sure how many people have heard this, but I'm sure a, a, a few people have actually heard this. But I started out on, obviously on, on eBay. First and foremost, I used to sell things on eBay here and there, hats, caps, hoodies, etc. But how I came across dropshipping uh, and the whole kind of like how dropshipping and then you kind of just go down a rabbit hole, right? Mm. Previously, before that, I used to look uh, online of ways how to make money online. I always wanted to be the person who could make money online because essentially, if you do that, then you have the, the, you know, the ability to travel all over the world. You're not tied to a certain place. I'm not a morning person, so I don't want to go to a place and open up a business. You know, uh, it wasn't really something that I'm interested in. So I wanted something that could, I could make money online via via my phone, via my laptop, okay, and Wi-Fi connection. Now, how I came across uh, dropshipping was, I'm not sure if you've heard of a forum called Black Hat Forum at all. Black Hat Forum? No, it's news to me. But essentially, yeah, 
it's a lot of people where they do really like black hat shit, right? Like <laughs> buy and sell domains, affiliate marketing. There's all sorts of different ways of how to make money online, essentially. Black hat forum, massive forum. And uh, essentially, I used to go on that at night time, like just trying to find ways to come across. And there'd be loads of, loads of different threads on there. And one of the threads on there was uh, someone had made like, I can't remember how much it was off the top of my head, twenty or $30,000 per month selling free products using AliExpress and Shopify. That's what the thread was called. And it had a load of uh, comments on side of it. And the guy was essentially doing free plus shipping back then, I believe, which was something which a lot of people were doing, whereas essentially what you do is you advertise a product for zero and you charge shipping. Now, of course, back then, with AliExpress, the prices, obviously, in 2016, a lot of prices have increased anyway. And by the way, I didn't make any sales doing the free plus shipping, never really kind of have. Um, that wasn't kind of something I wanted to, to go down. But essentially, I then got sucked into a rabbit hole of, of this whole dropshipping thing using AliExpress, using Shopify, using Facebook adverts. And, you know, he literally was answering questions. And then from there, it was like Facebook groups because no one was doing this kind of stuff on YouTube back then. And then from there, you just kind of get sucked into a rabbit hole and then you kind of just started things. But that's kind of like the the, the premise of how I got into things. Mm -hmm. You mentioned White Hat earlier and then you mentioned Black Hat here. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't touch on uh, White Hat, but now that you've said both of them, uh, I do have to ask, what's, what's the main difference between uh, the Black Hats and White Hats? And forgive me for asking this, but are there other color hats? Are there reds? Are there pinks? Are there greens? Are there blues? There's Gray, some people say gray hat, you okay. know, so that's kind of like borderline. But black hat is basically stuff that people, so a lot of affiliate marketers are black hat. So they do stuff which, again, I don't really do anything like that. So, but uh, it's like cloaking whereby they're redirecting links. And again, it's really sticky, but they kind sure, of stuff, sure. stuff will generally get banned on Facebook doing a lot of affiliate marketing and, you know, that kind of stuff. But then white hat is kind of like just normal clean stuff, which, isn't deemed black hat if that makes sense and then gray hat's kind of like the in between okay yeah i just wanted to uh, ask that one no problem so with regards to uh your first store so when i read it it said that you had spent uh, well it says 800 dollars because i saw the us dollar sign but i think that was just a translation because you would have to have spent in pounds 600 pounds depending 600? on yeah what okay. it was yeah i was advertising in pounds to start with. yeah 800 and you 600 pounds you walked away with one sale so it was uh, deemed a failure. You shut it down, moved on to the next one. Now, I think some people might be in a position where they see that money spent. Uh, they only get the one sale, but they say, I got to keep going with this. I don't want to shut the store down. I'm going to stick to this. So what exactly do you consider to be a solid failure state where this is enough? Now it's time to move on. So it, it very much depends on how you are as a person so some people get so emotionally attached to products or get so emotionally attached to something whereby they 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 and it's a good thing and it's a bad thing so sometimes it can be a good thing whereby people work through their failures and then they come out on the other end but then obviously naturally there has to be a point where it's like okay look i've spent too much money on this things are not working etc cetera, etc cetera. And that's going to come down to obviously how much money you have put in. You know, if you're if you're putting yourself into you know debt or your those kind of things, that's not healthy. Whereas if you have a job, you're getting a monthly income and you are putting in a percentage of that into your adverts, then providing you've got a job, you can continue on going down that road. But the most important thing is that you learn from your failures, and that's one thing that people can't or some people just don't know how to do. You know, and if you don't know how to do that, which in specific terms, is how to read your data. You know, if you don't know how to read your Facebook data and you're just consistently putting money out and you can't alter where things are going wrong, whether it's your click-through rate or whether it's your product page, etc. if you don't fundamentally know how to do that, then you're just going to continue to repeat the cycle over and over again. And there's a, uh, there's a quote, of course, of, of Einstein, I think it was, of, of, you know, insanity is essentially doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn essentially from your, from your, from your uh, mistakes to be able to move forward. Yeah. I mean, one way I can remind myself about that, being a bit of a creative type, some of it a weirdo, I had some, some growing pains for sure. And I feel like if I had gone into stand-up comedy later on in my life rather than earlier, I would have overcome a lot of those. And so basically, one of the things I wasn't doing that I should have done was reviewing my sets, uh, where after I finished, I would listen to it again and try to pick up on things. The problem was I wasn't able to treat it as something that can be analyzed because it was so artistic in nature. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but I don't. So I don't think that's how how this goes over here. It's it's very clearly about the data. It's very clearly about performance and results to the point where I think it's there. Maybe is a bit of a lack in of that uh, of that artistic and that creative nature. So uh, where do you uh, where do you find the creativity side of it? Where do you find the expressive side of it? So I think I've personally been a person who like to be a creative mm-hmm. personally. So creating logos. I'm self-taught on Photoshop. Again, I'm no Photoshop wizard. I can't do anything, you know, extreme out there. Again, <laughs> Premiere Pro, I'm not someone who can create a movie, but I can edit my videos. I can do things here and there, etc. So I'm a person who's very much hands-on and will try and do something myself before trying to hire a help, essentially. The good thing about, obviously, Facebook is while it is quantitative in terms of, you know, the, the results that you get and you can empirically measure, you know, how much view content you get and how much purchases you get and what your ROAS is. The Facebook platform itself is very a creative platform. So you still have to be some sort, or you have to have some sort of, what's the word I'm looking for, creative ability Mm -hmm. to be able to create something which is going to convert. Because again, it's not Google ads whereby, you know, it's just a link or it's not Google shopping whereby it's just that first photo and then the link and then the name of the product. With Facebook, you have to be creative in terms of your video ad, your video creative, your, your, your thumbnail, you know, your product page, those kind of things. Uh, and I think that's something that I kind of like, not naturally have, but it's something that I, I like to do. So I'd like to, I like to build a new website and make it look good before even putting it out there. And I think I am a bit of a perfectionist in terms of, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But I think some people have to have that kind of thing in there, have that about them, because it will help with your creative and your conversion rates as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great distinction between uh, uh, Facebook and Google. And we were we were covering the more of the Google side of it in the previous conversation that I had with uh, Marco Rodriguez, which should be out before yours in terms of release schedule. The difference is in Facebook, everybody is expressing themselves whether they're just saying what's on their mind or they're making a comment about something in the news, or there are posts about the news or there's posts about a a new release or something like that, people are still commenting on it. So they're still expressing themselves. Whereas Google is results-based. People are searching because they're looking for results on something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that makes, makes, that's a really good point. If you're looking for, uh, for more of the creative outlets, definitely Facebook is the way to go. There's a part of your journey that uh, stuck out to me. Now, to be fair, I did read about the part where you were uh, you were let go from uh, from a job position due to a, in their words, a redundancy. I, I, you're welcome to let us know a bit about that as well in, in this. But the part that I want to zero in on is that during your e-commerce journey, you were basically sleeping four hours for a while. Me, one of my favorite times in my life was in college. Uh, we had classes, we had assignments to do. Uh, we were expected to go out and perform so that we could talk about it back in classes. And on top of all of that, I was also working my, uh, my job at a grocery store. I loved it. I loved the constant momentum. I loved knowing that in the course of a day, I could have three different worlds to be in from class to maybe being with my family, maybe going to my job and then going out at night. But I also managed about, you know, at least six to seven hours of sleep. So it's intense, but it's captivating. I would like to hear more about this time in your life where you were basically running on fumes and how you managed to keep going throughout all of it. Yeah. So that was a very interesting time and the time where a lot of people would have stopped like halfway from where I kind of was because yeah essentially I was running on four hours a, uh, a day uh, on sleep and my routine essentially was now it, it's kind of like I'll explain it more because essentially the reason why I didn't leave the position that I was in because I could, I could have left my, uh, my my job way before you know I could have, but mm-hmm. I had a really good relationship with the uh, the manager who was there. Okay, and uh, at the time there was a few people who had to go on uh, uh, what's the word maternity leave. Okay, so they were off for six months anyway. And essentially the person that I am, I didn't want to just leave someone in the ship because it would have just been you know uh, his business. He was the manager owner essentially, so it would have put him in a difficult position. So. I was at the point whereby I was working, okay, I would get up in the morning, 7.30, I'd work at 8.30, get to work at 8.30, okay, I would work from 8.30 till 5, come home, I would sleep, okay, I'd take a nap because I'm super, super tired, sure. I'd wake up, okay, uh, I'd wake up, I'd either go to the gym, uh, no, no, I'd wake up and then I'd eat, okay, wake up, eat, and I'd either go to the gym or I would from then from like 8 p.m. 
all the way till like again, 1 a.m. in the night, 1 a.m. in the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., sometimes 4 a.m., and then just repeat the cycle. And that was like five times a, a, a week. I'd get to the point whereby literally I was tired as hell working. Like what I used to do is I used to, every break, I'd go and sleep in my car. So I'd pull the seat back like all the way like this, okay? And I'd just take 30 minutes just to just to sleep. Uh, I'd eat and then just conk out for like 20, 30 minutes and then go back into work. It was it was draining. But I, I also knew that there'd be a point whereby I would never do this again in my life, if that makes sense. I'd, it, yeah. I'd rather do that, get out of there now. And also one thing uh, I used to do when I first ever started my, uh, so when the first store failed, I started having success with my second store that I opened up. I used to have my notifications on for Shopify. And anyone who's new knows the Shopify notification goes cha-ching all the time, right? And I just have it there when I was working. I used to hear the cha-chings going off. <laughs> and I used to put, I put it, I put, I had to put it on obviously silent because uh, it was pissing a few people off. But that there would be the, like literally, the more of these I get, right i don't have to be sitting in front of this computer you know working for these people going into these meetings right so that's why i would come home and i'd work so hard so that i could have more notifications so that i didn't have to do what i was doing but it, again it just comes out or comes down to mindset and there's probably a lot of people out there sitting got to go to work tomorrow thinking shit you know so yeah work hard and you can you can definitely change things for sure yeah and i think it's important to have those times in your life where there is so much going on and you're being pushed to your limits. But I, I think pretty much everyone can agree, except for maybe a few people who just somehow have that infinite well of energy. It doesn't last forever. It's, it's, it's not healthy either to do that. I wouldn't recommend doing like that. That's not cool to do, by the way. Yeah. It's not healthy at all. No, I, 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 absolutely. But if you can handle it for a while, I did my grinding. And while I don't have the I mean, my vision of success is a little different from the vision of success that you have because I got into podcasting 10 years ago and the idea that I'm making a great living at it and I have the freedom to do whatever I want on my off hours. To me, that's something I never thought possible, but I kept, I kept going with it. If I, if I had known that I wasn't going to be able to get back into that state, I guess it would have been in the, the grind longer. I think maybe I, I, if I had stuck around longer, I would have been in a better position now. But point is, when you're in it, it really does pay off in the long run. Just you know, don't stay in it. Just don't just stay in it forever. Now, the this is one of your uh, your quotes. Uh, I'm 95 percent sure I got this from your Instagram. The term is like staying in your lane. About you know, make sure that you're f uh, focusing. I prefer to think of it as stick to your guns, which is mm -hmm. going back to uh, why sticking to podcasting has yielded a result that I'm uh, quite happy with. But what I, what I want to know is, how do you know exactly what your lane is? And what would it take for there to justifiably be a switch to another lane? So when I say stay in your lane, okay, I think it's been a bit interpreted different from what you may have got from it because sure. I think I think I think stick to your guns is a little bit different. So to try and explain it, okay, staying in your lane is for me is trying not to be influenced by other people okay or having other people's opinion influence you in a negative way so getting up and running with things again you've got to remember that this game okay is very numbers driven mm -hmm. you know whoever's making the most money or whoever's doing x y z always getting the highest row ass bloody blah, blah, etc et et it goes on and on and on and on and on okay if you are not uh you know doing those numbers every single day day, day in day out okay it can it can get to the point whereby you start to feel incompetent, especially as a new person. And I was in that position to start with, you know, you see people doing this number and you can't seem to get to there. And then what happens is, again, social media can either be your best friend or your worst friend. It can start to have a negative effect on you when you're looking at what other people have done and you're not there yet. So what I say is, okay, just stay in your lane, like your race and your lane is completely different from what someone else has done. If someone else has started, you know, 10 months after you and got way better results than you, so what? It doesn't make a difference, right? If you've been doing it for, you know, three years, et cetera, and, you know, you're doing way better than someone else, et cetera, whatever it may be, it, it, it doesn't make any, any difference because at the end of the mm -hmm. day, you should just stay and focus on like, yourself, you're running your lane. So that's what I mean by staying in your lane and not so much of uh, your lane being e-commerce or your lane being you know whatever it may be it's just kind of just like it's your race like you run it if you want to jog it jog it if you want to sprint it sprint it. and don't worry too much about uh what other people are doing 
find inspiration, okay? There's a fine line between inspiration and kind of like people like hating or, or then kind of like getting negative thoughts about it or I should, or envious is probably the word. So find inspiration and stuff, but don't take stuff too, too hard like that much. Mm-hmm. That's fair. I mean, one of the ways that I'm, I'm picturing this in my mind as you're describing it to me is compared to, say, a highway where, which I guess it's really more just like a regular roadway where there are traffic limits and everybody is expected to adhere to the certain rules. In this metaphor, the road is as long as there are people driving and everybody's got their own lane and everyone is just going to go at their own pace. And so you see people that are speeding past you and maybe you'll be jealous of them or maybe you'll think, oh, maybe they're going a little bit too fast. Oh, you know, to each their own, right? And then just uh, put, keep your hands on your, on your wheel and keep going forward. Okay, that clears it up. Yeah, because yeah, I, I was curious about that. We're, uh, we're, we're getting uh, close to wrap up time. Uh, I got a couple more of like, you know, mindset and mentality questions uh, for you just to, uh, to close us out. We all had a lot happen to us in this uh, COVID-19 situation. And you spoke about finding ways to stay positive in this, despite the hardship. Uh, and I can tell you, right in the heart of lockdown, I started looking for work. A lot of people were, were out of a job. I said, uh, okay, I got I to gotta, I gotta find something. I'm sure there's something out there. Thankfully, because my skills translate well into the remote sector. Mm-hmm. What did you do to maintain your, your positivity and convey that positivity to others? So again, I'm 100% ready for normality now. So Same. if yeah. anyone's feeling that way, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, it's been a long 14 days. Yeah, no, no one can really fathom what has happened, you know, if, if you're going back a year ago. But yeah, I mean, it, this year I, I have, there's been points where I just think to myself, like, come on, man. Like, like, I, like, but the year before this, I think I traveled to like five different countries or something like that. Like I was consistently traveling, like all of the time. And, and when you don't get to travel... You don't, you can't even go to your local restaurant, right? Without, right. without, you know. Here we've got a rule of six and those kind of things. So it's been, it, it has been hard to try and convey it across to, to 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 other people as well to say, look, stay positive. Because again, there's a lot of stuff which hasn't, you know, gone right for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Being in the e-commerce space, it's kind of been a blessing in disguise. Not, you know, you never want to capitalize on these kind of things, but of course. It has had that kind of, you know, every online store or every online thing has kind of seen as up spiking, you know, in revenues, etc. Uh, whereas personally, just being one of those people whereby it's like, okay, it's happening, it's happened, let's just continue forward and do what you can at this moment in time to try and, you know, stay positive. Whether that is sometimes, again, not going on Instagram, okay, or just having a bath on a Sunday just for two hours or not two hours, but just for like, you know, 45 minutes just to, just to chill out or something yeah. like that, or even just go and visit your friends, etc. those kind of things, just to try and have some sort of normality. But again, we've just got to try and push through it pretty much. If I'm being hundred percent honest. I'm at the point where it's like, okay, now let's get back to normality. I'm ready for it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I've never been uh, much of a traveler, but it certainly had an effect on my, on my worldview philosophy, because as a kid growing up, my idea of the world around me was just school. And then when my parents would take me to the mall, I felt like I was going on a huge adventure. I was like, wow, there's a, there's a roof. It's huge. And there's an arcade and there's all this stuff. And then I would get older and I would make my way to high school and my worldview would expand. And then college, there'd be another expansion. And by now, or you know, by 2019, I really felt like I had a really good grip on the city of Toronto. And I felt like the city was now my home. And so all of a sudden for that ripple effect to condense into this one apartment, uh, that, that's been hard on me mentally. Yeah. But we, we, we have found some, some positives in this uh, because we're going to have to try our best to find them. Uh, I think remote work is certainly more justifiable now. I think people are realizing yeah. how much money people are saving. Uh, my utility bill, oh, but that's okay. You know, I can write that off. Yeah, I think, I think, I think people have had to just find the skills. I think here in the UK, Unfortunately, our government is is trying to push for you know people who are in artistics because again people who have been you know singers, performers, those kind of things who perform DJs etc. Perform in the artistic, it's no longer happening. So they're trying to push people to retrain into other kind of fields, which is you know unfortunate, but you know it's one of those things whereby you kind of got to uh, adapt. And it's been it's been one of those mm-hmm. years whereby now going forward everything's changed it's a bit like you know the, the, the previous things which happened every everything that happens on large scale just changes the way we view the world 
And um, we just have to make those changes and fingers crossed nothing like this ever happens again, but ultimately mm-hmm. it will. And then there'll be another form of changes. You just got to learn to embrace change rather than to resist against it. I suppose. Mm-hmm. And it is, uh, it really is a fascinating time to be alive. You know, it's the, it just, it makes me think about the things that were on my mind and the things that concerned me before versus the things that concern me now. And it makes a lot of the stuff feel, uh, feel small. So I'll, I'll say this one last thing and then I'll move on to another question because I don't want to end on a, on a dour note, but the way I, I picture it in my mind is, you know, you see it like in TV shows and movies, it's kind of a trope, but somebody's swimming towards the surface and they're, and they're struggling and they're trying and they're, they're, they're going to make it, but the closer they get to the surface, the more desperate it seems because they're running low on resources. Uh, but they, they, they make it through their adrenaline k- kicks in and then they, some, well, <laughs> sometimes it's ice because that's extra drama and they punch through the ice and they make it out and they're good. And I think that's what we're going through right now. So it seems to be harder and harder as we get closer to the surface, but I am certain that we'll make it to the surface. The human race has put up with a lot of stuff over the years. I think we, we got this. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So uh, last one that I want to ask you today, uh, this is another one of your Instagram posts. It was a hypothetical proposition. So I think you, you, you'll, you'll recall this one. Um, there was option A, which is a 300 K a year position. You're working nine to five. You don't like the job, but you don't hate the job. It's, you know, it's mediocre. Uh, and then there's going to be some overtime in order to hit goals. And then option B is a hundred K a year, give or take, but you have the freedom to travel. Uh, you're your own boss, but there's going to be a lot of overtime. So it could be 60 hours a week. It could be 80 hours a week. So first I want to, I, I want to weigh in, but I also want to know what was the the consensus that you got or what was the feedback you got from that hypothetical? So pretty much 97% of people probably, yeah, probably about 90 to, yeah, I'd say about 90 plus percent of people uh, were all just taking the one which was, I'll take less money, less, you know, don't give me the boss, don't give me the, you know, the structured lifestyle, just give me the, uh, the, the, the freedom. And that was the main word, freedom. A lot of people were replying back with, you can't put a price on freedom. Having that freedom to be able to do X, Y, and Z, not being told this, that, and the other, uh, you can't put a price on it. You know, I'll happily take the reduction for that. And that kind of fits with the pretty much the reason why I put it out there, it was hard to kind of do so because you don't want to, you don't want to do too much money on the, on the paid one because it, it just makes sense. You know, you can make a million dollars, whatever it may mm-hmm. be. But for me, it comes down to having a freedom and the time, you know, the freedom and time again, are the, are the two things that again, you can, you can't get back. You can always make more money, right? I don't do well with being told what to do. You know, like if someone's consistently, oh, okay, you've got this to do now, but that's, you know, and it's due you know, in two days, et cetera, make sure it's done. Or, oh, have you haven't done that yet? It just really gets someone nerves. Like, honestly, just does my head in. So, yeah, that that that's kind of like my view. And that's what a lot of the, the, the people out there were saying. Yeah, the freedom is what a lot of people, being that main word, the freedom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of gratitude to Debutify because I do have my hours to fill and I have to be present for for interviews. But other than, you know, the couple of hours a week where I've got to be at a certain place at a certain time, I have more freedom than I've ever experienced, uh, but I also have mm-hmm. a considerable responsibility. Mm-hmm. So when I when I looked at these options, now again, like I said, I'm not much of a traveler, so the freedom to travel wasn't like a uh, a make or break. But my view on it is that out of these two options, one of these options is going to choose me; the other option is going to reject me. And option A, as appealing as it is, and, and there's some specific reasons why I find it appealing. One of them is that the job doesn't piss me off. Like mm-hmm. if, if I if I don't that's mind, why I added it in. Yeah, that's yeah. that's why that's why I added it in there. Because if you don't like the job, then it's okay, you know. Yeah, exactly. If you don't mind the job, some people are like, you know, I might yeah. consider it. Yeah, exactly. Like not minding a job is actually a huge advantage because that to me that would mean that there's no stress. And there's no stress, that means I can put a lot of extra energy into other things that I want to do. And, I, and I'm not worried about turning those things into money-making endeavors. Like if I just want to, like for instance, I'm helping a friend on his uh, Twitch stream uh, I, and I do artwork for him and I'm not asking for any money. I'm just happy to do it. So that to me would actually be one of the biggest benefits is that it's the, the energy that it takes from me is actually quite efficient compared to the stress of being my own boss. 
uh, having to be the first in line of defense against any issues. So it is a, it's valid, you know, I, I, and I certainly respect anybody who would pick option A. My thing is option A wouldn't pick me. Every, no matter yeah. how hard I've tried to, to fit into that mold, it just, it kicked me right out. And then I'm back to uh, making my own way around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the same kind of, there's never been a, uh, well, unless I was a footballer, which is what I wanted to do when I was growing up, it was either that or a business owner. I don't think any job that I've had, I have specifically seen myself, you know, doing, or I don't think there's any other job out there that I would like uh, to do that I would, you know, see myself doing for a long period of time. Now, to add to that is that I've worked more hours than I've ever worked in a nine to five in my life now, mm-hmm. you know, than I would be in any other night. Because you work 40 hours and that's it, you go home, you turn off, you do watch Netflix, you, you know, go see your girlfriend, whatever, you do whatever yeah. you want, right? Whereas the business, it's never, it's never off. Like you get a message from a VA saying something's gone down, conversion's not working, or, you know, bed account, ad account's been banned, etc. It's always on, you're always on. But I don't think I would have it any other way. And again, it just comes down to how you are as a person, essentially. And there's some people who, again, like you mentioned, it will either call out to you and you will, that will be, because if, again, if there's if there's not people in the system who enjoy that security or enjoy that type of, what's it, then society couldn't function. I mean, exactly. opposite end of things, if there aren't people who are willing to create businesses, create X, Y, and Z and go off their own thing, then again, they can't supply the people on this end. So... Again, there's there's those dualities which again you you either fit in them or you reject them. So I hundred uh, percent agree with that. Excellent. Well, we are just about to uh, hit wrap up. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. I I certainly enjoy this. I I hope uh, you feel the same way. Yeah, so me too, dude. awesome. So last uh, last chance for you to have the floor is uh, let people know how they can uh, get engaged with you. And if you want to leave anybody with any parting wisdom that maybe we, uh, we glossed over, uh, this would be the chance to do that. So take it away. Yeah. You know, don't give up assuming you're probably into, into e-commerce, no matter what stage you're at, continue to, to keep pushing forward in terms of, if you want to, you know, follow me, then the best place, if you want to get free content, okay. Everyone loves free content. Then, um, check out my YouTube channel. It's beast of ecom typed in on, uh, on YouTube, you'll find tons of videos on there. If you want to be in contact with me on a more personal basis, then check out my Instagram account, which is beastofecom, at beastofecom. And if you want to learn what I do or become maybe one of my students, again, I don't really want to be, I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of pitching stuff. So, sure. uh, but if you do, if that is something that you are interested in, then um, ecombeastcourse.com, yeah, or you'll find the link somewhere. Anyway. All right, excellent. I think that's plenty to go on. All right, Harry, once again, thank you so much for your time. Take care, dude. It's been a pleasure. Same here. All right. See you next time, guys. You might have found this show on many number of platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or right here on Debutify. Whatever the case, if you enjoy this content and want to help us thrive, please take a few moments to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you think is best. We also want to hear from you, so whether you think you'd be a good guest or want to weigh in on anything related to our show, you can email podcast at debutify.com or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Finally, this podcast is created by the passionate team at Debutify. If you're ready to take the plunge into e-commerce or are looking to up your game, head over to debutify.com and see how it can change your life and the lives of many through what you do next.